All right, here we go. I'm gonna call this meeting to order. Uh, we'll begin, uh, Madam Clerk, with uh, the roll call. Could you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Thank you, Madam President. Councilor Arroyo. Present. Councilor Baker. Councilor Bach. Present. Councilor Braden. Present. Councilor Campbell. Present. Councilor Edwards. Councilor Asabi George. Present. Councilor Flaherty. Here. Councilor Flynn. Here. Councilor Janey. Present. Councilor Mejia. Here. Councilor O'Malley. Present. And Councilor Wu. Present. Madam President, we have a quorum. Thank you so much. I've been informed by our clerk that a quorum is present. And as we begin our meeting, I just want to take a moment to reflect on the most consequential election in our lifetime. And I want to start by saying how proud I am. And I know that I speak for all of my colleagues uh, when I say that I am super proud of how Boston showed up at the polls yesterday and in weeks prior through early voting and mail-in voting. I want to thank all of the voters for making their voices heard and for participating in our electoral process. In addition to thanking voters, I want to take a moment to thank all of the poll workers, the election protection monitors, the volunteers, and all of our local leaders, local candidates who were on the ballot. And we also owe our gratitude to our own elections department. So many thanks to Commissioner Tavares and her team. While we don't know the results yet, what we do know is that one election cycle cannot undo structural racism. The situation that we find ourselves in was 400 years in the making. We did not get here in the last four years. And while it's very easy to point the finger and blame the occupant of the White House for his lack of leadership, he's a very easy scapegoat for how we're feeling and where our country is and the direction it's headed in. Um, but that's really too easy. This problem is bigger than one individual and it precedes the current administration. And so like it's too easy to point the finger at the occupant, we mustn't fall prey or fall into the trap of a savior mentality. There is no magic pill or quick fix, and there's no earthly savior. We are the ones that we've been waiting for. And no matter the election results, we as a city, we as a community, uh, we as a city council must stay focused on equity and inclusion in the city of Boston, and we must continue to focus on our black and brown agenda and creating real opportunity for everyone in our city and not just a select few. We must continue to do this work right now. We can't wait for election results. We can't wait until January. And what we hope will be a smooth transition of power. We cannot wait for another George Floyd or Breonna Taylor. We must act now. So let's get busy. And with that said, we will begin our meeting with the invocation, as we always do. I will turn over the mic now to Councillor Campbell, who will introduce our clergy. Councillor Campbell, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President, um, and thank you for your leadership, particularly in this moment in time. There's a lot coming at all of us, and so I appreciate uh, your leadership in this moment in time. And I, boy, do we need a word this morning. Um, Amen. <laughs> boy, do we need a word this morning. And, you know, I know from whence my peace and joy come from, but I am really, really happy to have Pastor Jansen with us this morning. Um, he is just incredible, and so it's, it's timely, to say the least. I want to, of course, tell you a little bit about him. Um, he is from the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Hyde Park, where my incredible team member, CJ, and his family have actually been going for over the past 15 years. He is an, an ordained minister. He has served in ministry for over 26 years in various capacities, including, of course, as senior pastor at his church, a professor of theology and religion, to youth, he's also youth and a, a young adult ministry specialist and evangelist. 
His ministry has taken him across the world, across the United States, the Caribbean, Canada, France, England, and South Africa. He has pursued his passion for community development and youth advocacy in various ways, including serving with the Black Ministerial Alliance as a leader in its Churches United for Youth Peace subgroup. This group focused on providing training, resources, and development initiatives to address some of the issues and needs specifically of Black and Latinx youth in the city of Boston. He is the author of the book, Daughter Zion's Trauma, a trauma-informed reading of the Book of Lamentations. He currently serves as an adjunct professor of religion at Oakwood University. He and his wife joyfully share in service along with their two children. Thank you, Pastor Jensen, for your support, not only of me, of our team. Um, and again, boy, do we need a word in this moment. So thank you for joining us this morning. Really appreciate you um, and your service to our community. Thank you. I'll turn it over Thank to you. Thank you so much, Councillor Campbell. Thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you so much for all uh, the members of this team um, as we work together uh, to make a difference in our great city. Um, shall we bow our heads as we approach the throne of grace? Almighty God, giver of love, giver of compassion, God of justice, God of peace, we invoke your presence today during this tense moment in our nation's history, during these times of uncertainty. We seek for solace, peace. We seek for decisive action to foster healing, unity, equity, and wholeness. In the midst of this moment in Earth's history, we are mindful of the ravages of the coronavirus, the pandemic, that has claimed so many lives. We have lost loved ones. We have lost neighbors and friends, co-workers. We have lost essential workers who've risked their lives to save ours. We lament those who have passed on. Our grief is ineffable. We also have lost many brothers and sisters to racial and systemic and institutional uh, pandemic of injustice. And we cry out to you. So many of our communities have been decimated. We mourn the lives of those who have been martyred for the cause. Our pain is ineffable. In the words of the martyrs under the altar in the book of Revelation, we cry out, how long, Lord? How long? How long until there is justice? How long until there is peace? How long until we can live together in unity? How long? Many have lost jobs and livelihood during this pandemic. Many have lost investments in homes as a result of the economic pandemic. And we lament and we join in solidarity with those who have lost uh, uh, their livelihood, those who have lost jobs, recognizing our common humanity, but also recognizing that we have the strength and we do have the resources and we have what it takes to thrive in spite of of all of the losses that we have experienced. And so we come together in this August group, this, uh, 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 this council, and we pray, Father, that your spirit will guide and lead and direct our elected officials. We ask that you will give them the courage to continue to uh, fight the good fight that you will give them the insight and the discernment to continue to press on in spite of challenges, in spite of difficulties, continuing to attend to the needs of those in our community who cry out for help daily, who cry out from under the burdens of oppression, uh, cry out from under the burdens and the cares that we live through every single day. I ask, oh God, that you will surround our elected officials and that, God, we will move beyond partisanship. We will move beyond our little silos, oh God, and we will see our collective needs. We will see the needs of those who are disenfranchised. We will listen and hear the cries of those who are marginalized, and, and we will hear the cries of those who have been underrepresented. We will hear the cries of those who have been systematically taken advantage of, and we will rise up together with them, and we will make truth and right 
righteousness our garb. We will stand in the strength of a God who has a preferential option for the poor. We will stand for the immigrants. We will stand for the strangers. We will stand for those who are minority communities. We will stand with them and we will stand for them. I pray today, oh God, that the members of this great body, as they make decisions, that ultimately you will be honored and pleased, that you will be able to say to them one of these days, well done, good and faithful servant, that when I was poor, when I was hungry, you passed laws, you undertook initiatives that made a difference. When I was in prison, you undertook reforms that benefited me. When I found myself a, a homeless, you undertook initiatives that supported me. When I was hungry, you fed me. That this body will make the decisions that will make a difference in our community as we await the results of our national election. We are uneasy. We are on edge. But we understand and we recognize that you are sovereign. Our people went out and people voted in record numbers. And so now ultimately we leave the results up to you. And when those results come in, I pray that as a nation and as a city and as a community, we will come together stronger and better and we will advance the cause of justice in our community, making our world a better place. We thank you, we praise you, and we exalt you, the one from whom our help comes. In the mighty name of our God, amen. Amen. Glory be to God and thank you, Pastor, and thank you, Madam President. Thank you. And that was a good word. Thank you so much, Pastor. That is just what we need to set us on the right course for this meeting. Um, it is our tradition after the invocation, we will pledge the allegiance to our allegiance to the flag. You are welcome to join us, Pastor, and stay as long as you like. I know you're busy. Feel free to leave after. We're going to pledge allegiance to the flag now. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America. Of America. And, and to the republic, the republic for which it, for which it stands, stands, one nation, one nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. Thank you so much. I'm just looking to see if we have been joined by Councillor Baker. I don't think so. Oh, Councillor Baker is here. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could please amend the attendance report to reflect that Councillor Baker is present. And we will now move on to uh, the first order of business, which is the approval of our minutes. Seeing and hearing no discussion on this matter, the chair moves for approval of the minutes from the, our last meeting, and I'm going to ask our clerk to call the roll. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam President. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councillor Campbell, yes. Councillor Edwards. Councillor Asabi George. Yes. Councillor Asabi George, yes. Councillor Flaherty. Yes. Councillor Flaherty, yes. Councillor Flynn. Yes. Councillor Flynn, yes. Councillor Janey. Yes. Councillor Janey, yes. Councillor Mejia. Yes. Councillor Mejia, yes. Councillor O'Malley. Yes. Councillor O'Malley, yes. And Councillor Wu. Yes. Councillor Wu, yes. Madam President, the minutes um, have been approved. Thank you so much. Uh, the minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. And now we'll move on to communications from His Honor the Mayor. We'll start with Docket 1085. Thank you. Docket 1085, message and order approving an appropriation of 182 million. $841,467 for the purpose of paying costs of designing, constructing, equipping, equipping, and furnishing a new six-story Josiah Quincy Upper School. This building will be at 900 Washington Street in the city of Boston, including the payment of costs incidental or related thereto, filed in the office of the city clerk on November 2nd, 2020. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 1085 will be referred to the committee on ways and means. 
Could you please read docket 1086? Thank you. Docket 1086, message in order approving an appropriation of 8,550,000 for the purpose of paying costs of designing, constructing, equipping, furnishing a new six-story Josiah Quincy's Upper School building at 900 Washington Street in the city of Boston, including the payment of costs incidental or related thereto, filed in the office of the city clerk on November 2nd, 2020. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. Docket 1086 will be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. And now we will move on to motions, orders, and resolutions. Madam Clerk, could you please read Docket 1087? Docket 1087, Councilor O'Malley offered the following order for a hearing to discuss access to the flu vaccine in the city of Boston. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor O'Malley. Councilor O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, obviously, I, I wanted to begin my comments on this, introducing this hearing order by acknowledging the yeoman's work that the Boston Public Health Commission has been doing and that so many of our neighborhood health centers. Um, and re really, we, we live in, in the, the medical mecca of the United States, and I've been extraordinarily proud of the efforts made as it relates to treating uh, COVID and testing the coronavirus. Um, the purpose of this hearing order is a little bit different, but obviously it's, it's, it's related. Uh, the, the, we are now form, firmly in flu season. It's typically uh, from October through March. Um, and there's a lot of concern. Dr. Fauci, uh, who I think we can all agree is an American treasure, has warned about the twindemic, uh, the pandemic of the coronavirus, as well as the flu, and how an individual could uh, theoretically develop both uh, illnesses uh, at the same time, which could have devastating effects. Moreover, the flu is um, can often be mis uh, or, or misidentified as the coronavirus, so we'll be taxing our medical institutions and our emergency rooms as well as we get further into flu season. So the purpose of this hearing order is to, A, acknowledge some of the good work that's happening um, as it relates to the city offering fl free flu shots. Uh, we have a vaccination, we have the flu shot. I've got mine, I'd urge you all to get yours if you haven't already. Um, unlike many other years, we don't seem to have a paucity of, of uh, shots this year. There seems to be enough for people, but we need to do a better job getting out the word to people why they need to get these flu vaccinations and influenza vaccinations and where they can. So as I said, the Public Health Commission, the mayor have done some uh, clinics, free clinics at City Hall Plaza, that's a great first step. Uh, but we also want to be cognizant of the fact that we should really deploy a far reach um, uh, opportunities in the neighborhoods. There are many folks who don't feel comfortable taking public transit or going in town. So if we could somehow better coordinate, and this could perhaps be done in concert with some of the COVID-19 testing, a deployment of the flu vaccine out to the neighborhoods, I think that we would be well served. I'm calling for a hearing today. We're obviously in the midst of flu season. It is November 4th. Um, so I'm hoping in short order next week or so, or, or potentially the week after if need be, we could have a quick hearing where we could convene the relevant stakeholders from the Public Health Commission, as well as some of our community health centers, hospitals, uh, and other you know uh, pharmacies that have been uh, ad administering them as well and figure out a way that we can better coordinate a deployment of the influenza vaccine to as many Bostonians as humanly possible. We have it. Uh, insurance, by and large, pays for this for most people. Uh, if not, I know there have been some great resources available to undercut and to underwrite the cost, as has been done on City Hall Plaza and elsewhere. But let's see how we can use our testing capability for the coronavirus and additionally offer a flu vaccine as well to Bostonians. Uh, I'm excited for this work. Again, this is something that we all agree with. There's no political downside to doing this. Um, there's no uh, concern that we can't do it or we can't afford to do it. We must do it, and we must do it by God during this pandemic because we could literally be talking about saving people's lives. So look forward to good work, bringing everyone together. We all agree what this needs to be done. Let's just do it quickly. Let's do it efficiently. Let's do it correctly. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Asabi George. Councillor Asabi George, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you to the maker. Please add my name. Um, when the boys were little, when the triplets were very little, uh, two of them got very sick with the flu. One was hospitalized with a collapsed lung and um, became seriously ill. And it was obviously a very frightening experience for me and my family. And since then, 
Um, our flu shots were important prior to that, but since that time, especially flu shots have become critically important to me and my family and creating as much access as possible and making sure that there's a greater awareness around the importance of one's flu shot um, is important to me. So I look forward to um, this, this hearing order and amplifying the concerns and desires around the flu shot and making sure that we're doing all we can. So please add my aim. Congrat Thank you to the maker uh, for bringing this before the body. Thanks, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor Sabi George. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. My internet is really bad. So you can hear me or see me but I'm gonna speak anyways and I'll find out. <laughs> um, so I just, I, so thank you to the makers for bringing this to the forefront. I just kind of want to highlight that in, um, in communities, particularly communities of color, there is a level of, of, of unease um, and distrust when it comes to all things that deal with vaccines. And so I think that I'm really excited to have this conversation and bringing people into it so that we can help um, folks uh, understand what's at risk and why it's so important. And at the same time, I think while we're doing that, I think it's important for us to also acknowledge the fear that exists. Um, I know for me, when I was pregnant with Annalise, I was told that I should do the flu shot because it was the responsible thing to do. And as a result of doing it, I got really sick afterwards. Um, and I have some reservations, but I think that given what's at stake here, it's important for us to have this dialogue and, 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 and making sure that the Public Health Commission talks about what are the benefits and also puts the fear at ease. Thank you for bringing this to the forefront. Looking forward to participating in the conversation and please add my name. Thank you so much, Councilor Mejia. Would anyone like to add their name? Show of physical hands, please. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councillor Flynn, Councillor Braden, Councillor Wu, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Bach, Councillor Baker, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Arroyo. I believe you also have Councillor Mejia and Councillor Sabi George. Please add the chair. And docket, what docket are we on? Docket 1087 will be referred to the Committee on Public Health. We'll now move on to docket 1088, please. Thank you. Docket 1088, Council Mejia offered the following order for hearing on expanding access for minority business enterprises into high volume commercial centers. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Hi, yes. Um, thank you, Madam President. I know it feels like every speech starts off with a thousand thank you. Use, but at, like all of our um, hearing orders, it took a village to get this one together. So I wanted to take a few moments to thank some of the folks for their advocacy. Um, Kevin Peterson from the New Democracy Coalition kept it real with us um, during this whole entire process, going from the idea to action, encouraging us to be bold in what we said to do with this hearing order. I also want to thank Councillor Flynn, who offered a perspective that really struck with me. In this, in this hearing order, we talk about Faneuil Hall Marketplace, a place that has seen a lot of resilience admissed. There's an opportunity, um, but in this hearing order, we talk about Faneuil Hall Marketplace, a place that has seen a lot of resiliency admissed. There's an opportunity to use this time to create space for black and brown businesses in spaces that have not always been available to them. But for some, even the idea of doing business in that area is traumatic given the name and history. But if we, if we take a step back and look at the issues of access for minority businesses in Boston is a citywide issue, one that directly co um, connects to our history of redlining and segregation. As someone who grew up in Boston during the busing era, I know what it, feel like, I know what it feels like to be brought into neighborhoods where it feels like you don't belong. And that pattern continues today with many of our small black and brown business owners. We need to find ways to support our minority businesses by encouraging them to not just set up shop in their neighborhoods, but to expand all across the city in every neighborhood. I want to conclude by, by talking about the election yesterday, even though I'm, sh I'm sure we're all tired of it by now. Regardless of who wins, we still have a lot of work to do across the country and in our city to address systemic barriers in our place for the people of color. We hope to use this hearing as a way to keep, to take steps back 
and look at what, as a city, we can do to ease that process. I look forward to this hearing and to learning more. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Don't see anyone looking to speak, so a show of physical hands for those who would like to add their names. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Arroyo, Councilor O'Malley, please also add the chair. Uh, docket 1088 will be referred to the Committee on Small Business and Workforce Development, and now we'll move on to Docket 1089. Thank you. Docket 1089, Councilors Campbell and Arroyo offer the following order for hearing regarding the Boston Police Department's gang database. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Campbell. Councilor Campbell, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Madam President. And I also want to thank um, Council Royal, which I'm glad you're feeling better, um, for your partnership on, on this particular hearing order and with respect to this particular work. Um, I also want to thank the dozens of advocacy organizations who have been mobilizing residents and collaborating with us, not only with respect to this particular issue, but also how we reimagine uh, policing in our communities. And we had a, a meeting recently with these advocates, um, and it was always, it was incredible. Um, and this was one topic of discussion. I think it's abundantly clear to many, and if it isn't, well, then wake up and pay attention, that we are in a critical moment where there is real attention and urgency around systemic racism and racial disparities in our policing system nationally and in, in, the, and in the city of Boston, where black and brown residents are disproportionately policed. Although Boston's population is roughly 25% Black and 20% Latinx, over 90% of the individuals listed in the BPD's gang database are Black and Latinx and are labeled gang-involved or affiliated by a point system that many see as arbitrary. To address and eradicate racism and racial disparities in our policing, we need to look closely at the gang database managed by the BRIC, how it's compiled, how it's used, not only within our police department, but also our schools, our courts, and other government agencies. And we need to ask, what is the purpose? Even if it's to serve, even if it's to serve public safety, what does that mean? And is that the only way or only strategy we have? This hearing order is to discuss the structure of the police department's gang database, the point system by which members of our community are added, its effectiveness, its impact on the lives of the 5,000 individuals that are listed, and many of whom don't even realize their name is even in the database or that the database exists. I've had a lot of conversations in the past few months with folks from the BRIC, obviously community members, residents, and advocacy organizations, and there's a lot of confusion about the gang database. So this is an opportunity for folks to come to learn, to get their questions answered, but then to do the hard work of really talking about the biases and disparities that exist with respect to this gang database in the harm it causes, not only to the individual, but to a family and a community when we get the listing uh, terribly wrong. And we've seen cases not only with respect to the criminal prosecutions, but also with respect to our Boston Public School students. So looking forward to this hearing, looking forward to hopefully every member of the council participating. Thank you, Madam President. And again, thank you, Council Royal, for the partnership here. Thank you so much, Councilor Campbell. The chair recognizes Councilor Royal. Councilor Royal, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, and thank you, Councilor Campbell, for your continued efforts uh, in this front. And I think one of the things, you know, today, uh, yesterday, certainly there's been a lot of thought and talk about, you know, the Constitution uh, and our rights and all of what that means to all of us individually. And one of the things that is sacred is the ability to confront an accuser or an accusation. And the way that the uh, gang database works where it's a anonymous sort of FIOs and I say anonymous because the person who is being FIO'd is never informed that they've been accused of whatever that FIO is accusing them of whether it's in a being in a location wearing certain you know clothing uh, discussing or talking to somebody else and so there's never an opportunity for that person who is being labeled by this arbitrary point system to then say hey I can I can definitively prove that that's not true. That never happens. And what ends up happening in the system, I was a public defender, is you end up 
with people who are labeled as gang associates or gang members and don't realize that until another crucial moment in their life, whether it's an immigration hearing or some sort of, uh, you know, whether it's a civil or a criminal court uh, issue or whatever is happening in their life and they're realizing at that point, wait a minute, I was labeled as a gang associate or as a gang affiliate and I had, you, you did all these FIOs allegedly and I've never had a chance to ever counter or discuss or, or look into those. And some of these FIOs and then the FIO reports aren't even clear on details like what they're actually accused of. And so, uh, you know, we have FIOs reports that just say intel, for instance, whereas a police report would say a whole bunch of information. Um, and so there's real issues with that. And, you know, I've spoke to Brick about this uh, in the interest of hearing from them and, and what they believe uh, this serves, what purpose this serves. And I would, I would caution uh, the city and the council that the purposes that Brick believes this serves may not be the same purposes that ICE or immigration believes this serves or that prosecutions and prosecutors believe this serves. And so there's a situation here where what one person believes the value of this is is not the same as what another group is using this database for and the harm that it is inflicting is not uh, in any way equivalent to the protection that we believe it may or may not be giving the city of Boston. And so I think there's a lot to be looked into on this. There's clearly racial biases that are in play in this. There's clearly over-policing that are in play with this. There's clearly over-surveillance of communities of color that are in play with this. And so when we talk about the gang database, you know, we, we wouldn't be the first city to talk about a gang database in San Francisco and Chicago. They've had these conversations, and I believe New York, they've had these conversations. And in many of these places, they found that gang databases are deeply flawed uh, and, not, and not really productive for either uh, the lessening of crime or any kind of kind of community benefit to it. And so I look forward to this hearing. I look forward to a much longer discussion about what we get out of this and, and the harms that it inflicts, uh, either unintentionally or intentionally. And so those are the kind of conversations I think we have to be having. And so I'm grateful uh, that we're moving forward with this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilor Arroyo. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam President. And I really want to commend the makers um, for this. I think that as, as um, Councilor Campbell alluded to, uh, we have a lot of great advocates um, who have been pushing hard for a reexamination of the gang database. I also think it's timely because um, there was a case that came down from the First Circuit Court of Appeals uh, in mid-May. It came down May 15th, I think, um, Diaz-Ortiz versus Barr. Um, and in it, uh, a young man was deported um, basically solely on the basis of the fact that uh, he was in our gang database as a known gang member. Um, and uh, when the dissenting judge, there was a there was one of the federal judges dissented. The other two said, well, we just have to take on face value what the police department said. This is a proper um, database, uh, a proper sort of uh, authority. And then um, Circuit Judge uh, Lippez, you know, issued a dissent in which he argued at the core of the immigration judges and Board of Immigration Appeals rejection of Diaz's petition for relief was an adverse credibility determination based on a gang assessment database so seriously flawed that reliance upon it by the judge and board violated Diaz's due process rights. Um, that's our database. He then does a detailed analysis of the fact that this um, young man was in the database entirely because of FIOs, um, which is something I don't think that should be possible. Uh, and to go on in the judge's words, put simply, Diaz was denied relief from removal based on quintessential teenage behavior, hanging out with friends who unsurprisingly were also young Hispanic men. The record lacks any evidence that those social encounters were linked to criminal activity that would have been a proper basis for recording them and any explanation by the government as to why the point system is nevertheless a reliable means of determining gang membership. The flaws in the gang package, which Diaz brought to the attention of the IJ and the um, Board of Immigration Appeals, cast serious doubt upon the accuracy of Diaz's classification as a gang member. Um, and, and I just think that uh, with the, the level of analysis that was done by this federal judge recently of our gang database here in Boston, um, we absolutely need to prioritize uh, really, really pulling it down to brass pack, tacks and uh, thinking about how to fundamentally change the system. So again, I'm really grateful to the proponents uh, and look forward to the hearing. Thank you, Madam President. Thank, thank you. you. Name added. Yeah, yes, Councilor Block, you're adding your name? Of course, yes, yes. thank you. Wonderful. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Council Mejia, you're on mute. 
I'm having a hard time with my internet today, so I'm we can hear you to... now. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, I just wanted to add my name and to thank the sponsors for uh, this hearing order. Having um, worked in the Boston Public Schools and working with students who constantly feel um, harassed, I think that this is an, an, an important time in our history with this particular council that we have under President Council Leadership Janie, um, who's always fighting for issues of equity. I think that we are well positioned um, to really move the work forward um, and looking forward to not only having this conversation, but centering it on the lives of those who are dealing with this issue every single day. I'm, I'm, I'm deeply concerned as well as um, to, to, for those who are undocumented um, and looking forward to um, supporting both Councilor Campbell and Councilor Arroyo um, and making sure that we bring the people into the space um, to have their voices heard. Thank you so much. Thank you. I don't see any other blue Zoom hands. So let me just, before I take on who's going to add, let me just also add my two cents. And one, thank you to the makers. What Council Mejia just said in terms of this impacting our young people, our students in our schools, very much true and very much connected to the ordinance that Councilor Arroyo and Wu and I have about um, reporting and what happens in our school buildings. So I think this is a very timely conversation. I'm grateful to the two of you for bringing it forward. And at this time, would like to see a show of physical hands for those who would like to add their names. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Braden. Councillor Wu, Councillor Asabi George, Councillor Mejia, Councillor O'Malley. Um, I believe you have Councillor Bach already, and please also add the chair. Uh, docket 1089 will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Madam Clerk, if you could please read Docket 1090. Docket 1090, Councilor Wu offer the following resolution, opposing MBTA service cuts and urging essential public health and safety measures during COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Council Wu. Council Wu, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, this has been an ongoing conversation that has uh, really brought public transportation and, and it's importance to all of our residents, but especially our central essential workers to the forefront during this pandemic. And we are yet again in another position where I'm asking the, the council to stand up again um, against the, the proposals by the MBTA, which are uh, looking to focus on, on budget numbers rather than health, safety, and the future of um, our recovery. The T early on in the pandemic did recognize that the safest way to run bus service, the most equitable way, the most effective and efficient way was to allow riders to board from the rear door, shielding drivers, allowing people to space apart, getting on the bus faster, having more uh, the one bus able to run more routes so that people could space apart and wait for the next one. Uh, they had reversed this policy in uh, late summer, citing that the numbers COVID cases had come down. Um, and also concerns about needing to pick up, uh, find fares and increase revenues once more. We are seeing now COVID cases on the rise, accelerating very quickly again, and yet rather than return to prioritizing public safety and health procedures on our buses, um, the T is saying that they're moving forward, uh, proposing to cut service in, you know, across the system, a permanent cut, uh, there, there's not a ton of details about how those would look. And of course, they've said they will try to prioritize those lines with more um, essential workers, et cetera. But we should not be having a conversation about cutting service in this small window right after the election and before the uh, knock on wood um, new administration takes office in January. This is an issue that will require federal conversations, and we should not act in a very short-sighted way to, to put in place permanent uh, service cuts while people are most needing to find a safe way to continue to get about during this pandemic. Uh, so this will be on the docket in the, at the Fiscal Management and Control Board over the next couple weeks. So I'm asking the council to join in going on the record opposing service cuts and asking the T to prioritize safety measures once again. Thank you, Madam President. 
Thank you so much for your leadership on this, Councilor Wu. The chair recognizes Councilor Block. Councilor Block, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I also want to thank Councilor Wu. Um, I have spoken on this issue already before the fiscal, um, the management control board, but uh, I think that we really do need to speak as one as a council. And I'll, I'll be brief and just underscore the fact that public transit is a public good, and it's the kind of public good we need more of in this pandemic. And you know, the same way that people have needed more food in this pandemic, they've needed obviously PPE resources like never before. The reality is that folks rely on public transit to get around, to get to their essential work, um, to get to their families and and um, folks that they're supporting in their communities right now. And we need we need more public transit so that people can space out. Um, and so really it is exactly the type of instance where you can't be talking about it as paying for itself, right? The PPE isn't paying for itself. The food isn't paying for itself. It's part, it's part of getting through this crisis. Um, and, and an expansion of public transit is part of getting through this crisis. And, and I am aware that the federal government has put us in a really difficult situation. Um, and I think that to some extent, these service cuts you know, are being anticipated is partly a game of playing chicken with the federal government about whether or not it will come to the aid of ours and other public transit systems around the country. Um, but I just think it's so important to understand the anxiety it creates for people who live every day of their life on this system. Um, and I, I completely agree with Councillor Wu that, um, I mean, we need to really be hoping that that federal aid will come through. And if not, the state just has to recognize the T as an utterly crucial part of its public infrastructure and figure out how to prioritize it in, in this moment. Um, and I just think that's a non-negotiable. So I wanna thank Councillor Wu and please do add my name, Madam Clerk. Thank you so much, Councillor Bach. The chair recognizes Councillor Braden. Councillor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I also want to like to, like to thank Councillor Wu for her initiative on this uh, resolution. Um, I obviously would like to on, sign on and support um, cuts in the MBT service, uh, MBTA service at this time are, are totally unacceptable at the best of times, but it's even more so in the midst of this pandemic. Um, in Alston Brighton, we have a huge number of um, new development, a tsunami of new development, thousands of new units, uh, and it's all transit oriented, which basically means that um, the residents are relying on the on the T and our public transit to to get around. So, uh, not at this moment we should be investing more in our public transit and not cutting. Um, we obviously understand uh, the public health benefits of expanding, but also the long term needs for in significant investment in mass transit in 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 the MBTA uh, are are an urgent need that we just need to keep pushing for. So um, I hope that we will get more funding, but I think this is not the moment to be cutting the service. And uh, I would be happy to join my colleagues in signing on to this resolution. Thank you. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Campbell. Councillor Campbell, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Madam President, and thank you to the maker for her leadership on this critical issue. You know, obviously my district relies heavily um, on public transit, even before the pandemic to get to and from their obligations, including work. Um, and I'll just add, um, during the pandemic, you know, the essential workers are also coming from my district and are relying on public transit. Um, but one of the things I, I wanted to flag too, it's not just essential workers, of course, that are relying on the T. We're also talking about folks, for example, survivors of domestic violence trying to get to a court date. We recently had such a situation in my district um, out of Dorchester District Court. A woman gets on the bus in the freezing cold to go meet her attorney for a hearing that was actually postponed. They didn't notify the family, um, but stood and waited for long hours to get to her destination um, and waited for long hours for the bus. And so it's an ongoing issue. Um, and in this moment in time in which we're seeing, whether it's cases uh, involving domestic violence or other things on an uptick where people have to still go in person to get uh, services and solutions to some very hard, hard issues, the T is absolutely critical to that. So just wanted to add my voice, definitely add my name, um, and thank you, uh, Councilor Wu, for your leadership here. Thank you so much. Would anyone else like to add their name? Show a physical hands, please. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Flynn. Councilor Asabi George, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Mejia, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Baker, Councilor Campbell. Please also add the chair. 
uh, Council who seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 1090. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Docket 1890, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor Romali. Yes. Councilor Romali, yes. And Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, docket number 1890. Um, is supported by all members. Yep, I have 1090. I wasn't sure if you said that 18 before uh, because yeah, of the I internet, see. but I have 1090, just so that we're clear. Oh, On go. the agenda, 1090, Council. Oh, my goodness, you are absolutely yeah. right. <laughs> okay. So 1090. Good catch. Good yep. catch. <laughs> Thank you. 1090 has been adopted. Thank you uh, so much. And now we're, we're moving on in our agenda. We do have a couple of late files um, today. Um, the three matters, and you will have, uh, you should have an email already. Uh, the three matters is one is a, is a letter from our colleague, Councillor Edwards. Uh, the second is a hearing order from Councillor Flynn. And the third is a resolution from Councillor Flynn. So everyone should just take a moment to look in your emails if you want to actually see uh, those dockets. Um, we will take a roll call vote to add them to the agenda. And we'll do that now, Madam Clerk. Thank you. We add three late, <coughs> excuse me, three late files. Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Bach, yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Councilor O'Malley. Councilor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Um, late files um, are properly before the body. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. Um, if we could begin with the first late file matter, if you could read that into the record, it's the letter from Councillor Edwards. November 4th, 2020, from the office of Boston City Council, Lydia Edwards, District 1. Dear Council President Janey and Council Clerk Feeney, I regret to inform you that I will be absent for our weekly council hearing on November 4th, 2020, due to a personal matter. Kindly read this letter into the record. Sincerely, Lydia Edwards. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. That particular late file matter will be placed on file. If you could please read the second late file matter into the record. And this is the hearing order from Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Um, offered by Councillor Flynn, order for hearing to discuss renewal fees for restaurants and food establishments during the COVID-19 pandemic. Whereas our restaurant industry has been severely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, as restaurants see a drop in customers, limit seating capacity in their establishments and adjustments to relying heavily on takeout and delivery. Whereas we should continue to discuss ways to help our restaurants survive this pandemic. 
such as examining whether payments can be waived for license and permit renewal fees or other types of financial assistance. Therefore, be it ordered that the appropriate committee of the Boston City Council holds a hearing to discuss license and permitting renewal fees for restaurants and food establishments during the COVID-19 pandemic. Representatives from the Boston Boston's Office of Economic Development, the Licensing Board, representatives from the restaurant industry, representatives from delivery companies, as well as other relevant and interested parties shall be invited to attend. Filed in the Council November 4th, 2020. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The Chair recognizes Councilor Flynn. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President, and um, thank you, Madam Clerk, and I apologize to my colleagues for, for the late file. Um, Madam President, I'm bringing this forward because we know during this difficult economic time, many of our restaurants are continuing to close almost every day. Um, restaurants and bars play a, an important role in our city. They're not just a place to gather with friends and have dinner, but they're often a, a full-time job for someone or a part-time job for someone paying their bills, paying their electric bills, sending their kid to school, uh, paying for transportation. But they also, our restaurant owners also contribute to the community, whether it's a Little League program or it's a dancing program. Uh, they're always the first ones there. During this difficult economic time, it might be an opportunity for us to consider as a body ways where we can be helpful to the restaurant and bar owners, such as waiving fees that might impact them, such as alcohol licenses, business certificates, um, and other, and other uh, fees that they pay to the city of Boston. Um, whether it's waiving the fees or getting on a payment plan, I just wanna see what we can do to continue to be helpful and advocate for our restaurant owners. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. Just checking for speakers. Yes, uh, the ch I apologize. I'm not sure the order. The chair recognizes Councillor Sabi George. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President, and thank you to the maker for this. Um, over the last month or so or three weeks, there's been a number of conversations um, I've had that I, I'd like to share those with Councillor Flynn, both with business owners and the administration around around. Uh, the possibility of um, looking at how we can better support our local businesses, especially those that are required at this moment in time. As we hit the calendar um, this time of the month, all of those fees are coming due. And um, as our businesses are facing uh, deeper restrictions in the coming days, this is a, such a critically important um, conversation for us to be having and an important piece of, uh, potentially a piece of legislation or action or policy that we should undertake to support our local businesses. But keeping in mind the impact that this could have on our city's resources and the impacts of the state's budgeting process. And um, I think a, a significant reduction in revenue at the city level for us in the coming fiscal year and uh, the implications of the state budget on our city's budget in the coming year. So really important uh, work for sure. Councilor at large. Excuse me. Really Thank important. You. Please continue, Councilor Sabi George. Uh, Council President, uh, really important for us to have this conversation and, and it's certainly very timely as those bills are coming due for our local establishment. So uh, certainly um, look to uh, partner or, or follow the leadership of Councilor Flynn on this and partner any which way that I can to support this effort. Please add my name and look forward to uh, this hearing uh, soon. Thanks. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank uh, Councillor Flynn for his leadership on this issue. Um, this is a in our district here. Uh, it's a critically important um, uh, concern of our restaurant owners and our bar owners about how they are going to uh, manage to weather the uh, coming months and to stay afloat and to stay in business. So, I, I welcome the opportunity to look at any possible ways that we can help alleviate their financial stress on these businesses. Uh, also uh, bearing in mind that uh, we also have to 
um, consider the impacts on the, the city revenue. But I really hope that we can come up with some practical solutions that will help uh, relieve the, uh, the pain on this situation. Thank you. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor O'Malley. Councillor O'Malley, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, rise to really commend the maker, Councillor Flint, for his leadership on this. Uh, to distract um, the anxiety that many of us were feeling in the middle of the night, I actually began working on this, so I'm delighted that he's he's done the work. So please add my name. This is, this is a huge issue, and at an absolute minimum, we need to delay. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can just cancel these fees, be it TV, liquor license, uh, entertainment license, um, and an absolute minimum, we need to delay it because I'm starting to hear from some restaurateurs in District 6, and I'm sure all of you in your respective districts are starting to hear. Um, there's so much uncertainty. There's the, these, the, This industry has just been walloped by this pandemic. We will see likely a fifth to a quarter of all restaurants likely close in Boston. So this is seems needlessly cruel, not intentionally, of course, but any way we can... Uh, solve this issue sooner rather than later as it relates to pausing the fees and hopefully canceling these fees because they do add up will be better i will say this that we we should call out um we've been able i think uh perhaps better than some other industries to be nimble as it relates to the restaurant industry making it easier for um uh, liquor uh, to be delivered for example or to allow takeout in restaurants that didn't have the proper licensure so i think that this is the next logical step as we uh, sort of hunker down for for phase uh, or or for the third wave uh, of this pandemic. Please add my name. Thank you uh, for your work and leadership on this, Councillor Flynn. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, please add my name and obviously to the maker, uh, willing to obviously to to do a joint hearing if possible on the matter we had filed a couple of weeks ago with respect to all, of, all the social clubs and our cultural clubs who are in the same exact. Uh, predicament, uh, many of them uh, not able to open and or struggling to stay afloat and also have all these licensing fees. And those are the Elks and the Kiwanis clubs and the Knights of Columbus and the Irish Social Club and the Lithuanian Club and the Bocce Club and the, all of our veterans post, uh, the Karnak post, all those things. And everything across the board uh, has uh, has the same impact as to how are they going to uh, dig out and, and pay these fees. So that may be something that um, the lead sponsor may want to entertain. If not, then we can just uh, continue to, to just uh, look at them separately, uh, deal with obviously our, our social clubs and cultural clubs, et cetera, and then obviously deal with our restaurants. But we'd like be nice to get the, the licensing board in on, on both of them. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. The second late file, well, uh, who wants to add their name? Show of physical hands. Thank you so much, Madam Clerk. If you could please add Councillor Braden, Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Bach, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Baker, Councillor O'Malley, Councillor Sabi George, Councillor Wu, Councillor Campbell, Councillor Flaherty. Please also add the chair. Um, this second late fall matter will be assigned to Small Business and Workforce Development. Um, Madam Clerk, could you please uh, read the third late fall matter? Thank you, Madam President. Offered by Councillor Ed Flynn. Resolution commemorating Veterans Day and honoring all those who served our country. Whereas Veterans Day is celebrated every year on November 11th in the remembrance of the end of World War I, as well as to honor all those who served in the US military. And whereas it is also important that we recognize the service of our women veterans, LGBTQ veterans, veterans of color, and veterans with disabilities, all of whom have made sacrifices in order to serve and deserve our continual recognition and support. Therefore, be it ordered that the Boston City Council honors those who served the military for our country on Veterans Day and continues to support our veterans and military families in Boston. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, may I add um, Councillor Arroyo as an original co-sponsor, please? Yes, yeah, seeing and hearing no objections, Councillor Arroyo is added. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Madam President, I've filed this uh, resolution every year on behalf of the council members 
to recognize our veterans and our military families that also serve. We have, over the last 20 years, we've had many people from our city engaged in um, various deployments and wars, but it has taken a major toll on so many families and so many veterans. And we continue to lose about 25 veterans a day through suicide. But this body has been um, active and involved on so many issues, whether it's um, services for our homeless veterans that Mayor Walsh's team and Sheila Dillon have been excellent on. Uh, my city council colleagues have been excellent on so many issues as well. But the 25 young men and women that continue to take their own life by suicide is something that um, impacts all of us. Um, coming back from a, a deployment, um, veterans are often engaged in um, the VA healthcare system. It's playing a critical role, but we need to do more and, and try to help as many returning veterans and older veterans as well, including our, our women veterans and disabled veterans. I always, I'm glad Councilor Arroyo was an original co-sponsor with me. I always had Councilor Edwards too because of her, because of her service of her mother. It, it's a unique perspective as the woman veteran and as a, as a military family as well. So I wanna say thank you to all of my colleagues and to Councilor Edwards, who has always been there in support of our veterans and military families. And she brings a, a, a unique perspective to this debate and discussion as well. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much, Councilor Flynn. The chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam President. And thank you, Councilor Flynn, not just for his work on this, but for his service to our country. Uh, you know, I, I've spoken about this in the past. I've had a family member uh, represented in every war since World War I. Uh, my grandfather fought in World War II. Uh, and I often think, you know, we just had a, an election uh, that is still ongoing. Um, and I often think about how we honor those sacrifices that they've made. Um, and when we talk about this, I believe it's important to talk about it in the whole. And the reality is the experiences of women in our military uh, and the experiences of people of color in our military have been uh, impacted by the very same inequities uh, and injustices that we have seen play out in our civilian government and the way that that works. And what I have found is that those who have come back from serving this country abroad uh, have created connections that cross uh, racial lines, that cross gender lines, uh, and that they become stronger uh, through service. Uh, and I think Councillor Flynn, for instance, is a perfect example of that. Somebody who's been in, in uh, a position where he's heard from and seen different perspectives and life stories, and it has impacted and shaped the way that he sees the world. And I think when we talk about where we are now and how we honor veterans, I think it really means that we need to make sure that when they get home, we're doing the work to make this a more just society all the way around that we're doing the work to ensure that they're receiving the health care benefits, the housing benefits, if they have uh, these sort of mental health issues that many come back with, um, or the substance abuse issues that sometimes people who turn to uh, in despair, that we are doing the work to ensure that we are eradicating those issues, not just for them, but because of the work that they've done to ensure that we have the ability to do that. And I think, you know, as we move forward into this next week, uh, things are going to play out. Uh, nationally uh, with our democracy. And, you know, I spent a lot of time yesterday thinking about my grandfather who served in World War II and was not seen necessarily as somebody befitting of all the rights of this country when he came back. Uh, and the reality is we sit in a real balance on our democracy and what democracy looks like, no matter who you voted for or how you believe going forward. And I think that in the next week when we're celebrating Veterans Day, it's really important to understand that the core thing that they fought for was equality. The core thing that they fought for was our constitutional right uh, to exist, to be counted, and that we look at this as a way of honoring our veterans is honor, honoring the democratic process. And so, uh, you know, I, I thank Councillor Flynn, uh, Councillor Flynn for his, his own sacrifices and as far as uh, including me in this. Uh, we have a deep uh, place of respect uh, and love for our, our veterans and our 
in our family. And I thank all of our counselors uh, who have had people who have given uh, themselves to this country. So thank you. Thank you so much. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to quickly thank Councillor Flynn and Arroyo for um, this resolution. I last, uh, I think it was in September for National Suicide Month, I talked about um, my own loved ones that I had lost to suicide. Um, what I did neglect to say was is that my cousin um, was a veteran. Um, he committed suicide in 2015 and the family is still um, feeling unresolved in regards to that. So I just wanted to thank Councillor Flynn for um, his continued advocacy in this space um, and know that um, our veterans are loved and they need to be supported when they come back from fighting on our behalf. So thank you, Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Arroyo. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, not seeing any other speakers, a show of physical hands for those who would like to add their name. Madam Clerk, if you could please add Councilor Braden, Councilor Sarbi George, Councilor Wu, Councilor Bach, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Baker, Councilor O'Malley. Please also add Councilor Campbell and the chair. Uh, Councilors Flynn and Arroyo seek suspension of the rules and adoption of this third late file matter, which is the resolution honoring veterans in military families. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Thank you. For the third late file matter, Councillor Arroyo. Yes. Councillor Arroyo, yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Councillor Baker, yes. Councillor Bach. Yes. Councillor Bach, yes. Councillor Braden. Yes. Councillor Braden, yes. Councillor Campbell. Yes. Councillor Campbell, yes. Councillor Edwards. Councillor Asabi George. Councillor Asabi George. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Flaherty. Yes. Councillor Flaherty, yes. Councillor Flynn. Yes. Councillor Flynn, yes. Councillor Janey. Yes. Councillor Janey, yes. Councillor Mejia. Yes. Councillor Mejia, yes. Councillor O'Malley. Yes. Councillor O'Malley, yes. And Councillor Wu. Yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Madam President, the third lay file has received a unanimous vote. Thank you so much. This third late file matter has been adopted and will now move on. Uh, if anyone wants to remove an item from the green sheets, this is your opportunity. Not seeing anyone wanting to do that, we will continue to move on in our agenda. Next is the consent agenda. There have been no additions, um, which is great. So the chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda as it exists. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Um, Councilor Arroyo. Yes. Uh, Councilor Arroyo. Uh, Councilor Baker. Councilor Bach. Yes. Councilor Braden. Yes. Count, I'm sorry, Councilor Park, yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Yeah. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Edwards. Councilor Asabi George. Yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flynn. Yes. Councilor Flynn, yes. Councilor Janey. Yes. Councilor Janey, yes. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Councilor Mejia, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. And Councilor Wu. Madam President, the consent agenda has been adopted. Excellent. Wonderful. Now we are moving on to announcements. A show of blue hands, please, for those who would like to make a brief announcement. The chair recognizes Councilor Bach. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam President. Um, I just wanted to say um, I, I'm coming to you from upstate New York because I'm on my way back from knocking doors in Pennsylvania. Um, and I won't make a comment about uh, winners and losers of this election. But I think it's really incumbent upon all of us as elected officials to stand for the principle today that every vote needs to be counted in this national election. And I say that as somebody who has talked over the last few days to hundreds of people who made the effort to cast their ballot as a mail-in, whether they put it in the post 
before they, um, in the case of Erie, Pennsylvania, took it to the one drop box outside the county courthouse. That was an intentional act of thousands, millions of people in our country who were trying to participate in their democratic process following procedures that had been laid out by their states that were right and proper. And I just think this isn't a, this shouldn't be a Democrats, Republicans thing. Um, and this isn't negotiable. This is completely foundational to what democracy is. Um, and so I just think it's it's really important today for us to all stand on that principle. Thank you, Madam President. Amen. Any other announcements? Wonderful. Well, just quickly, there was a council luncheon scheduled for after this meeting, which is being postponed. Uh, so be on the lookout for it for new dates there. I want to thank Councillor Flynn for bringing forth that, that late file matter, the third resolution. As folks know, we will not be having a meeting next week. Next week is November 11th. Uh, that is Veterans Day. Certainly grateful to all of the veterans who have served and certainly to our very own Councillor Flynn. Uh, so we will not have a meeting next week. And thank you, Councillor Flynn, for that resolution. Any other uh, announcements before we close out today's meeting? Not seeing any blue hands, uh, we will now move on to uh, memorials. Um, as is our practice, we close out every council meeting in memory of those we have lost. Uh, today, we will be adjourning our meeting in memory of Roger F. Sullivan for Councillor Braden. A moment of silence, please. Thank you. Uh, the chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in memory of the afore aforementioned individual. And we are scheduled to meet again, not next week, but on Wednesday, November 18th at 12 noon. Um, for the safety of the general public and all those involved, this meeting will be held virtually and posted online. Viewers can watch the council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. Now, all those in favor of adjournment, please indicate by saying aye. 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 This council meeting is adjourned. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. M Madam President, there was no consent agenda. <laughs> okay. So we'll just, hopefully no one's looking for it. <laughs> so, all right. Thank you.